So the first presentation will be by uh, Melanie Morrison from uh, the University of um, California about semi-automated tools for cerebral microbleed detection and volume segmentation. All right, thank you. So thank you to the um, organizers for inviting me to present this talk. So I'll be, um, can you hear me okay, by the way? Perfect. So um, I'll be presenting our tool from the uh, Lupo Lab at UCSF. Um, that is a semi-automated semi tool for cerebral microblade detection and segmentation. So I have nothing to declare. Um, I'll start by talking about what cerebral microbleeds are, and then I'll talk about the detection problem for microbleeds. Um, I'll introduce the semi-automated tool, um, some recent applications of the tool, and then how you can access our tool. So cerebral microbleeds are tiny hemosiderin blood deposits that appear after brain microhemorrhage. They're typically two to 10 millimeters in size and are best detected on T2 star magnitude or susceptibility weighted images. Um, they've been detected in a wide range of patient populations, including patients treated with radiation for a brain tumor, uh, stroke patients, dementia, traumatic brain injury, blood disorders, as well as even um, healthy aging adults. Um, they've been largely linked to cognition, and so um, uh, based on their biomarker potential, there's been a really large interest in identifying ways to uh, reliably quantify these microbleeds um, in an efficient manner. And so in terms of detecting them, I mentioned that you can detect these on two types of images. Um, the use of uh, susceptibility weighted imaging that uh, leverages the, the phase data to increase the susceptibility contrast. Um, turns out that it actually increases sensitivity for detecting microbleeds. And some of our, our work um, in 2013 from the Lupo Lab showed that there was up to a 54% increase when using these um, uh, susceptibility weighted images versus the magnitude images at 70. Um, the field strength also matters. So of course, as you go up in the field strength, um, you increase your susceptibility effect. And so um, this is just one representative case, representative case where 112 microbleeds were, um, additional microbleeds were detected just from going from the 3T to the 7T SWI. Um, so assuming that you have the 7T SWI data that you want to detect microbleeds from, how do you do that? So traditionally, uh, or originally people would just manually count them and segment them. And of course, this can take very long. Um, some patients, for example, uh, the population we tend to look at in our lab is patients treated with radiation. And some of these patients have upward of 300 microbleeds. So it just becomes an almost impossible task to do. And this is where semi-automated approaches have come into play. And in developing these algorithms, there, of course, have been some challenges to face in terms of being able to detect microbleeds of the same size on the, in the same patient, and then also of course, um, minimizing the number of false positive detection. So you can see in this um, figure here, these are two microbleeds and on this slice, they appear quite similar around in shape. Um, but as we go through the slices, you can see that the one circled in red is clearly a perpendicular vessel and a false positive. So this is a problem that we face. Um, so there have been a handful of um, previous attempts to develop to do this, um, to develop these computer-based tools. Um, here's a, just a, a list of some of them prior to the tool that we developed. Um, the one highlighted in red is our initial, uh, original publication in 2013 um, of our computer-based algorithm. And, and so what you can appreciate from this um, slide here is that there's a big trade-off with the computation time sensitivity and false positive reduction. So um, some studies have um, had pretty good sensitivity, uh, relative sensitivity with the fewer, fewer number of false positives, but very long computation times. Um, for our original algorithm, we had a pretty good sensitivity around um, 86.5 and about 45 false positives per patient. And it was a quite fast computation time. Um, but of course, these, these neural networks have much higher sensitivity, but of course struggle with uh, some of the precision aspects. So one of our motivations for updating our algorithm was to really tackle these false positives while maintaining maximum sensitivity and uh, relatively fast computation time. So in 2018, when I, um, I, I worked on this project um, and uh, updated the algorithm to mainly improve the specificity. So the false positive reduction 
I added a volume segmentation um, component as well as a report generation. And really the goal of this, uh, going from this original to this user guided tool was twofold. So we wanted to generate a tool that could allow us to expedite the process of generating labeled data for future deep learning based detection algorithms. Cause there wasn't really an efficient way to do that. Um, especially when you want to look at thousands and thousands of microbleeds. Um, and then second, um, just in the process of routinely evaluating and collaborating at UCSF, we uh, found that there was a need for a user guided tool just for researchers or uh, radiologists for routine evaluation of microbleeds with a little bit more um, transparency. So just going through the, the um, detection algorithm, it uses a fast radial symmetry transform that is used to um, detect these hypo intense microbleeds that are, that are circular in shape. So this is applied to the um, input um, SWI image and it generates this FRST map, which basically has a little dot or a little um, binary marker uh, where there are potentially circular uh, shaped objects. Um, it also performs a, a vessel, we also perform a vessel mask by using standard thresholding and then using the FRST map and th vessel mask, we look for only those, uh, those little pixels, those binary um, regions that are not vessels, but could be microbleeds. So these are typically just those circular um, um, hypo intense um, objects. So from this FRST map, we apply region growing, which is just a standard dilation. Um, and again, because these are hypo intense, um, it only it only dilates to the region, the local region of hypo intense pixels. And then after that, we use empirically derived features. Originally, this was developed um, on 3T uh, data in um, patients who were treated with radiation, 15 patients. And so we look at features, um, including the area, the circularity, and if it's shifting. So again, if like vessels kind of move uh, across slices. So we look at the centroid of that um, microbleed through um, through plane, and then we get detected microbleeds. So that was all the original algorithm. And then uh, from that output that detected um, number, the detected CMB mask, we applied an iterative segmentation process using just standard thresholding, and then did a second layer of false positive reduction to make sure that we got rid of as many false positives as possible before um, feeding all of those um, those putative or candidate microbleeds into a GUI. Uh, so we use Imagine, which is an open source tool that's available for MATLAB. And we use this to present the user with candidate microbleeds so that they can decide uh, if a microbleed is a hard mimic or if it's a traveling uh, microbleed, or sorry, if it's a false positive or a, or a, um, a true microbleed. And so um, I'll just show a quick video here to make that show uh, demonstrate how this works. So you can see this is the GUI and I'm tapping through the slices and this is a, definitely a microbleed because it's consistent throughout all the slices in one location. The algorithm also gives me a, um, a hint that this may be a hard mimic and then you can click yes or no and go through the next one. So this one also looks like a microbleed. And again, the GUI highlights that this may be a hard mimic and then you can answer yes or no. And it goes through all of them. This one here is an example of a microbleed that is traveling very clearly a vessel. And so you would put an N for a no. And the other um, third option is that uh, the microbleed can be in just one or two slices. Um, I don't know if I have an example of that one here, but it can be either in a, a single slice and usually that's um, not a microbleed. Um, what's also nice about the tool is that uh, the, the um, the graphical user interface that's open source and available um, is that it has a zoom feature. So you can kind of zoom in on smaller microbleeds, especially for these irradiated patients and, and just make your decision based on that. So um, the final portion of the um, tool is that it creates, it generates a text file report and this highlights the final number of microbleeds, um, how the user classified them as either, uh, for example, if it was traveling, but you still decided it was a microbleed. In fact, it tracks that information. It also tracks all of the false positive information, the mean uh, microbleed volume, and then it uh, tracks every individual microbleed, their size and the slices that they occur on if you wanna go back and make any manual modifications to segmentation. So going back to this chart and then adding in our, our, our um, tool that I just uh, talked about, the one that we updated, 
you can see we have the same um, sensitivity approximately as our initial tool. Um, and uh, the processing takes about one to two minutes with the features that we added. And then the manual portion, um, depending on the patient population you're looking at, it could range anywhere from five minutes if there's only a few microbleeds, or it can go up to 22 minutes um, in, our, in, in some of our examples where we had upward of 300 microbleeds. Um, and our intercross class correlation, when we looked at different uh, neuroradiologists rating these microbleeds, was at 0.97. So um, pretty good agreement across raters. Um, so moving on to recent applications from this work, I mentioned that the goal was to develop um, part of one of the uh, parts of the um, motivation for this was to develop um, label training data. So um, uh, Yisun Chen, in our, uh, who previously worked in our group, um, developed a 3D deep neural network to be able to perform false positive uh, classification. So this is this basically um, involves using the initial the initial detection algorithm here with the susceptibility weighted imaging inputs or the T2 star weighted magnitude inputs, whichever you have available. And then it um, basically you run this initial algorithm and then it runs the neural network to then further classify um, whether it's a false positive or a true um, positive. So um, basically this algorithm was able to maintain about 95% of true microbleeds and achieve a false positive reduction of 89% and precision of 71.9, which um, performs better than um, the previous um, algorithms that have used deep neural networks. Um, and then the kind of main take home is that there was around 11 um, false positives remaining per patient. So um, in the, when you have a patient who has somewhere between 50 to 300 microblades, that's actually not that many in the grand scheme of things. So um, it performs pretty well. And um, it's relatively easy to, to use uh, in addition to our initial tool. So um, other applications that uh, we've uh, uh, that have used this algorithm to uh, um, acquire or to generate um, microbleed counts and then relate them, for example, with clinical outcomes. So we, like I mentioned, we've uh, evaluated a lot of this in irradiated brain tumor patients. And so some of our work has involved looking at uh, young adult, young patients and, and adolescents, as well as adults with, um, with microbleeds following brain tumor treatment. Um, in collaboration with a group at Imperial College London, we also looked at microbleeds in uh, patients with immune thrombocytopenia, which is a rare blood disorder. And other groups um, have also used our tool, which is very exciting and, and done their own um, studies, for example, in this case here with post-concussion. So as far as who's using our tool, this is just based on initial interactions that I've had um, with individuals from different schools um, who uh, in the initial process of kind of getting through the bugs and, and making sure that the tool worked for everybody. So it's nice to see that we have usage um, on, uh, across the US and some places as well in Europe, which is really nice to see. And I imagine that it extends beyond this. This is just based on interactions that we had. So how to access our tool, um, you can hop onto the Lupa Lab GitHub. You can um, just type in CMB Labeler in Google, or you can take a picture of the QR code here. Um, and then on our GitHub, the CMB Labeler is the third one below here. And then the deep learning tool that I mentioned is available just above it there. Um, and we also have a tool for um, QSM processing using deep learning, as well as another tool to um, look at uh, other vascular characteristics, um, in, including vessel thickness. Um, I should mention here that the, the top two tools were in the process of um, updating these files to make sure that it works well for everyone and just doing tests. So if you wanted to test out these other, these top two deep learning tools, I would just check back in about a week or so. And um, we have uh, my email that's available there if you are interested in using the tools. As far as our microblade labeler tool that I just went through in this talk, that's um, open and available and people have been using it successfully. So just to dive a little bit into, um, just for those who may not be familiar. So if you go onto the GitHub, you can under code, you can access our GitHub link. Um, from the terminal, you can just type git clone and that, that um, link there, and that will download the whole package for you. Um, or Matt, and then in, in MATLAB, 
uh, you just have to add the path to the folder and then there's a one wrapper function that you can run. And all of this is included in the instructions in the microblade labeler um, repository. So with that, I will just uh, thank Janine Lupo, who runs the Lupo Lab at UCSF. That's Janine there. Um, and then Wei Bion, who uh, created the original microblade algorithm. Eason, who worked on the deep learning tool. And Sivakami, who worked on some of the other vascular tools that are on our GitHub. And this is our brain group and our Lupo Lab team. And just want to thank everyone uh, for using our tool. If anyone in the audience has used our tool before. Great. Oh, and Thank you so much for this talk. <laughs> yep. So uh, if you have questions, please uh, enter them into the Q&A. Um, maybe while people think about questions, I can uh, ask something. Um, so I think that the, the original package is only using MATLAB, right? So it should be fairly easy for people to download and use. Um, the deep learning extension, do you need to install uh, Python and TensorFlow and all these other libraries? Yes, so um, it yeah you it, you need to download the proper environments, but we are um, we are um, prov providing all the instructions like step by step to hopefully make it e straightforward and easy for everyone to use. Um, it does require an input, um, it, so it does require you to run the initial microbleed tool first. So you run that one in MATLAB, and then the output of that. Um, you then run, which is the microbleed mask, you then put that into the deep learning tool. And so we'll prov we provide the steps to create the map file that you need to then input to the deep learning tool, which is a Python script. So everything will be available on there. And there's also my email on the GitHub. So we work kind of like one-on-one -on -one with people if they um, want to try our tools and uh, to make sure it works for everyone. Um, Cause there are some of course requirements with the different versions and stuff as well. So. Um, we're just making sure that everyone can access it and, and make sure that it works for them. Cool, thank you. Um, maybe one more quick question. Uh, you mentioned that on average you find uh, eleven point six false positives. Um, can you express that as in like a percentage? Because I am sure some patients or some people will have more microblades than others. Yeah, that was just for ours. Um, so the precision for that, I believe, it was like seventy one point eight percent. So that's the um, that is the false positives divided by the false positive or the true positives divided by the true positives plus the false positives. So precision is kind of like a relative measure that you could use. Um, okay. in terms of percentage, I can put that, I can drop that in the chat, um, and just take a peek at the, um, the paper and just double check that. But, um, on average, I mean, the papers that were included in the, the table that I showed, um, so patients with, um, microbleeds following radiation therapy, they tend to have quite a significant number of microbleeds relative to other patient populations. Um, so it seems like, um, regardless of the, even if you're looking at healthy controls, there's usually somewhere between at least 10 upward to like 50, um, false positives, um, across all different patient populations. So at least from my own literature search and review of, of different tools. Cool. Uh, one final question actually from the audience. Did you encounter any challenges, uh, pushback translating your tool to the clinic? Um, so this tool, um, it's mainly used, I would say, by researchers right now. Um, but we have had um, some people internally, uh, radiologists use the tool um, for rating purposes. And so we've actually trained probably about four neuroradiologists at this point. And I will say uh, in that process, they, um, for, for individuals perhaps who didn't have, didn't have any prior experience using any sort of um, you know, MATLAB or any tools like that, they actually were able to run it quite easily. So that was um, a little pretty rewarding to see that clinicians could use the tool um, without too much difficulty and no prior experience with the computational stuff. So. Um, yeah, the hope is that I'm, I mean, while it's make, while it's created for, for researchers at this point, um, the tool itself, because it is a, is a tool that can be used to look at like an individual case. We, we hope that it would be available, um, if there's interest for, for neuroradiologists to use it as well for clinical purposes. 